Hello and welcome to Tisky Sour. I'm very excited today for three reasons. John McDonnell has just announced a proposal for like proper 21st century socialism. I mean like really good stuff. Uh, that's reason one. Second reason, we've got Matt Lawrence from the IPPR who's going to explain what McDonnell's vision for 21st century socialism is in the second half of this show. But in the first half of the show, and this is the third reason I'm very excited, we have the one, the only, the chair of the Labour Party, Ian Labry, MP. Woo! Woo! <laughs> oh, I hope me doing that into the microphone wasn't really audi 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 <laughs> orally. Or it always confuses me. Hourly. Hourly horrible for you. Uh, of course, I'm also joined by Ash Sarkar, Aaron Bastani, both senior editors at Navarra Media. What's How up? are you, Michael? I'm good. I told you, excited for three reasons. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? I'm really excited. This is the first time you're actually recording on my good side. Oh, Aaron. Oh. I'm really excited. Both sides are great, babe. No, I'm just kidding. Imelda Marcos over here. Uh, Michael always bags his everything. Michael bags his the best cameras, the best lighting, I really. think. He doesn't need the best lighting or the best cameras. Right. Look at that yeah. structure. We're in the presence of the chair of the Labour Party. Yeah, can sorry. we not do this, please? You don't need the good lighting either. How are you doing? I'm, 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 I'm very well, thank you. And it, it's good to be here. And I think Navarro Media did a brilliant job on behalf of the Labour Party, by the way. Cheers. Um, and I'm not sure if I agree with everything you said on this week, last week, by the way, Michael, but excellent. What, me? Aye. Specifically, what did I say? Uh, well, you said loads and loads and loads, but we'll have a chat about that it's, it's, uh, in a more right. appropriate We can do it on air. But it's good to be here, by the way. Yeah. Absolutely delighted to be here, and thanks for the kind invite. Well, it's, absolute, uh, it's, it's absolutely a pleasure to have you on. You said that you'll talk to him later with the tone of someone who's like, hold my pint while I sort this out. <laughs> Well, I quite often get, you know, accused of being terribly aggressive. It's my voice. <laughs> I've got a really powerful voice. And people do, at times, think I'm being terribly aggressive. And I'm a really nice chap. A pussycat, really? Um, not exactly, but I'm not as, <laughs> not as aggressive as what some people potentially make us out to be. We are going to talk about what's happened over the last couple of days later in the show. But first of all... I mean, we haven't had you on before, so we need to talk about you, yeah? We want, we want to talk about who you are. So I was, uh, you know, on the internet today, I found out some interesting facts. Not only were you part of the miners' strike, you were the only apprentice to refuse to work during the miners' strike. Is that right? Yeah. And what does that mean? Well, in, well I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, listen, on the run-up the miners' strike, I was slightly weird, I was, you know, how can I put? I was a bit wild as a young young fella, um, and when the minor I worked at the pit. I left school. I didn't have the opportunity to go to university. Right? I didn't have that opportunity because of my upbringing. Fantastic upbringing. Lovely parents. Great family. But we didn't have the opportunity to go to university. Nor would I want to go to university because I didn't even like school at the time. So you know, I, I like people in my community went to the pit and worked underground at the age of uh, 17 and a half. And I then got an apprenticeship, which was brilliant. Proper apprenticeships, by the way. Not like the apprenticeships you get now, where you work for six months and you get kicked out like your dog in the night. This was a five-year apprenticeship, a management uh, apprenticeship, which was really, really good. And I was delighted. My father got us the, into the pit. That's what happened. And the minor strike came. And I was, you know, listen to these unions listening to these fantastic orators at these meetings telling me about injustice and how the world was broken how the coal industry was was broken you know the likes of Scargill was brilliant the likes of Tony Bain uh, Rodney Bickerstaff uh, Dennis Skinner and I just was mesmerized by it and my whole family was on strike you see we had like uh, seven people at home your mom my dad and, and sorry, six people at home, my mum, my dad, and four brothers, and we, apart from my mother, were, were all on strike. So we, my father was a, a big union man, and we went to the union meetings, obviously, when the strike uh, began. And the union, the NUM, the fantastic union, the NUM, I've got to say, decided that because apprentices uh, were, as a class, indentured, they were protected by strike action, and they had the opportunity, apprenticeship, apprentices, sorry, to go to work. And I was sitting talking to my dad and I said, look, the union are saying that I really should be going to work. What do you think? And he says, a real bad idea. And my father said, you know, if you 
cross picket lines, which I would never have done anyway. He says, for the rest of your life, doesn't matter how you try to explain it, you'll be classed as a scab. And because of the very fact you'll have to explain to people why you, you went to work, uh, it's bad enough. And, and you know, at a time where we had everybody on strike, my mother didn't have like 10 pence in a purse to pay for the whole family. And we're all big brutes, by the way. Um, you know, me, me father just simply said, it doesn't matter, you cannot. And that, that was probably the, the wisest advice that I've ever had. So I like went on, just simply went on the picket line up and down the country and enjoyed the minor strike. It was the best education. You know, people can go to university and get the best degrees, physics, sociology, whatever. I've got a degree from the University of the National Union of Mine Workers in unity and in solidarity. That does me. And you only really became the president in the NUM, right? Yeah. How did that happen? Well, uh, you know, like following the strike, um, I finished me, uh, me education. Uh, and then immediately, well, following the strike, I immediately got elected onto a, a branch position at the biggest colliery in Europe. Uh, and then it made me way up and, you know, I was like Scargill's uh, left-hand man for quite some time and when Arthur Scargill retired in 2002, it was basically a, a coronation. Uh, I wasn't opposed by any area and we had a lot of pits at the time. You know, so I didn't, I, I, it was a coronation and I took over from Arthur in 2002. And if that still been pits, let me tell you, I would still be, uh, mm. would, you know, I would have preferred still to have been uh, a trade union secretary because it was brilliant representing some of the finest people in some of the finest communities in the country. It was brilliant. It was really, really brilliant. So something that lots of people forget is just how diverse and broad-based the support for the miners' strike was because we look back on it and we just think of it as like, okay, it's just like, you know, a bunch of like, you know, ginormous white guys. It wasn't. My mum and my grandma was like going up to support the miners and was something which, again, uh, not as many people as should uh, know about this, do know about this, is that during the Grunwick strike, which was led by uh, South Asian women, uh, uh, photographers... Uh, developing a uh, plant. Um, it was Arthur Scargill who supported it vocally and from fairly early on and brought down like bus loads and bus loads of miners. So the solidarity that was going on at the time, it wasn't just um, the community surrounding pits showing solidarity. It was miners themselves showing solidarity with all other kinds of industrial disputes going on up and down the country and it really did cross gender uh, race and it was a real working class well, movement that, that, at the time. That's, that's why Thatcher knew at the time in 1984 in order to basically try and slaughter the trade union movement she had to start with the most powerful union in the country if not one of the most powerful uh, unions in the world and she decided on the, uh, the NUM used the full force of the country the full tools of the, the police, the judiciary system, uh, the army, the, the armed forces against ordinary people like me and my family. And Thatcher knew that if she could beat the miners, then there would be well, a domino effect. And I think that's what we, we, we saw at the time. But you know what? It was a great year. And just being part of that struggle was one of the best experiences I've ever had. I've heard a recent statistic. I mean, you tell me if it's wrong. Apparently one in four people of working age were on strike at some point in the, around, maybe it's the late 1970s, early 1980s. One in four, one in four people, you know, actively employed in the labour market. Well, like on the same day? <laughs> no, no, just generally over, over the course of that year. Yeah. Right? And you think that's pretty much everybody has a cousin or a best friend or a brother or a sister or an ex or whatever. So that, that's unbelievable now for the modern psyche in terms of trying to understand what that meant as a labour movement and its role in national life. Obviously, we're in a very different place now. So, I mean, yeah. so this is something which I've always wondered when I've been hearing uh, these kinds of stories from people that participated in strike action at this time, because now um, there are some very strong unions still, of course, which like can get you know decent amount of adhesion to a strike call out, like, you know, can hold picket lines fairly well. But I think that people th understand strike as kind of it's a symbolic gesture rather than a, you know, tool of collective bargaining. And it struck me that with the defeat of the miners strike, it wasn't just about breaking the power of a union to collectively organize. It was also about decimating a 
valuable working class social institution. It was about attack attacking those bonds of solidarity, those bonds okay. of collective identity. It turns us into consumers, <clears throat> very, very atomised. But before we like get carried away and say that the miners got beat, I would simply say that the victory was in the struggle itself. And we we had a you know, we had somebody the 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 Thatcher government, the whole tools of the state basically saying bring it on. There was you know, the mining industry were very powerful anyway. We we represented um, you know, hundreds of thousands of members. We had two options, we either take them on or we'll rule them and die. And we weren't prepared to rule down and die. So we, you know, we had the, the action which we had. But you're right, I mean, it's, it's different times now. The reason it's different is because part of the Thatcher project was to introduce the anti-trade union legislation, which is still all in place, a vast majority of the still in place. We even seen the Tories um, two years ago introduce the Trade Union Act, which again was an attack on ordinary working people up and down this country. Something that nobody wanted, really. So we, we suffer attack after attack after attack. And you know, when you continue to get attacked, you've got to stand still and start either fight or you roll down and submit. And we, we weren't prepared to do that. So, I mean, to be more uh, future oriented, what can those working class political social institutions look like going forward? Now, we don't have mass union membership in quite the same way or mass union action in quite the same way. Um, how how do we move forward? How do we rebuild well, those connections? I, I think it's it's really important. We still got between six and seven million trade unionists in this country. We still got some really big, powerful unions: Unite the Union, Unison, CWU, um, to, to 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 mention but a few. The GMB, of course, as well. And the the only way that the unions can become to a maximum effect is to get rid of the anti-trade union legislation. Bring the legislation up to date, and you know that's what I would anticipate. This wonderful carbon project, it'll move onto that. And what we have said within a hundred days, we'll repeal the the trade union act anyway. Um, but we've got to get we've got to get much further than that, and we've got to give more power back to ordinary working people in the workplace. And we've seen that in a different way today, not regarding strike action. But the, the, the comments from John McDonald today were absolutely mm. superb. It's what people are crying out for, for heaven's sake. You know, so we, we've got to roll back leg, uh, the prohibitive legislation, not just to repeal the, the old acts. Uh, we, we've got to look forward and reduce acts uh, into law, which gives the trade unions uh, and individual members in the workplace more power. Well, we'll talk about the implications of John McDonald's proposals in a second. First of all, I want to ask, you've talked a lot about the union's sort of central role in left struggle. Um, this week, there's been some headlines about conflicts between the unions and other left, other people within the left struggle, right? So especially with regards the democracy review or with regards MP selections or the nomination of the next leader. Um, there's been a perceived conflict between the trade unionists on the NEC and the CLP reps on the NEC and potentially the trade unionist delegates on the conference floor and the CLP delegates on the conference floor. Do you see that as a tension that actually exists? Well, you know, the the comment you make is it, 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 it's, it's not correct. I'll tell you why it's not correct. And that is because the NEC voted, for example, for the democracy review, uh, and they the, the voted on it unanimously. So there wasn't any split on the NEC with regard to any part of the democracy review. Whether it was part of the you know the nomination procedure to get Jeremy or anybody else on the ballot paper, there wasn't any conflict there. And there wasn't any conflict indeed in the suggestion with regard to the uh, the trigger ballot, and, you know, the, the change in the position from the 50% to the 33%. There wasn't any conflict at all. It was basically uh, unanimous on the NEC. And I think there's been some misrepresentation of, of what's happened. I think people think that the democracy review, by the way, mandatory reselection or selection of MPs wasn't part of the democracy review. Mm -hmm. um, however, 
I think people believe that Jeremy was of the view, and he's been blocked, that he wanted mandatory reselections. But you know that 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 wasn't the case. This is Jeremy Corbyn's Democracy Review, and I understand people have got different uh, views. I know people wanted open selections. We have moved uh, t to like try and in, in in many ways compromise to get an agreement so we can move forward. Because let me tell you. I, and I, I mean this, I'm really, really serious. We're not going to get another bite at being a socialist government and a mass movement. We're not ever going to get a better opportunity than what we've got at this moment of time, particularly the way we're being attacked by the Tories. Everybody's being attacked. The country's on its knees, and we cannot be seen as a, a, a left movement to be having arguments and disputes among ourselves. And that might mean compromise. Of course it might. I mean, I'm not a great uh, lover of being compromised. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if we want it, you know, if we're serious, we're going to have to compromise on occasions to get what we want. You know, we've got to focus. We've got to focus on the big picture here. And that big picture is that we get the keys for Downing Street. You know, it, it isn't any good me and other people travelling the length and the breadth of the country, motivating with 550,000 members, encouraging them and enthusing them, keeping them, you know, keeping them enthused, involved in politics and hopefully moving to a million people. Uh, that, that isn't any. That's no good if you're not really going to get the keys to Downing Street. So that's you know this long project. This is a ten-year project in my view. A ten-year project. We've got to come together. We've seen through history the way opportunities come and go. The left is fragmented on 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 many occasions. We haven't ever had a, a golden opportunity or a rare opportunity like we've got and we've got to come together because there's not much difference between uh, the, the left on the issues and we cannot be seen to be fragmented we've got to get behind there be united be strong and you know what this isn't a pipe dream this really isn't a pipe dream and we've got to stop messing around it isn't a pipe dream the people in this country need a Labour government and they need a Jeremy Corbyn led Labour government if that means a bit of compromise here and there so be it the, the 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 wider picture is ever so important. So th that, that's that's the issue. Well, the NEC agreed unanimously with regard to uh, section six and section eight in the democracy review. In fact, the democracy review in its entirety. So we we've only got ten more minutes of you, and then you've got to go give speeches to other people. So I'm going to do one question, then you get a question each. Beautiful. Yeah. And, then, um, and then Ian, you get to. Uh... Am I speaking too much? No, no it's beautiful. You're you're you're. You're the special guest, and you're only here for half an hour, so you get to speak as much as you want, mate. <laughs> so it's one big that's, the, that's why you're here. That's why you're here. Let me talk. You have a sip of uh, Have a breath. Come back in. Right. So the question I have: uh, You've talked about how the left can't afford to have sort of conflict amongst itself if it's going to take on this Tory government. Obviously, there's a lot of challenges ahead for us. One conflict which has at times seemed irresolvable within the Labour Party has been about Brexit. So we saw yesterday. Uh, I think it was, yeah, it was yesterday, a big march for a people's vote. Last night, a compositing meeting and some controversy this morning uh, when John McDonnell said Remain would not be on the ballot paper. That upset some people from the sort of like another Europe is possible movement or the progress types as well. So there's left wingers and right wingers who are in favour of a strong Remain position from the Labour Party. Uh, how do you look at this dispute? amongst different parts of Labour's well, constituency with reference to Brexit. You, you know, Mike, the, 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 the truth is the country's split on this issue. Every constituency is split on the issue. The unions are split on the issue. The CLPs are split on the, uh, the issue. The Tories are virtually in absolute meltdown, thank heavens, on this issue. Could uh, reign. we have a general election very soon uh, because of the, the chaos and the, the situation therein. So we, the, the, the Labour Party position hasn't really changed much. And my personal view is uh, I'm, I'm fully supportive of the position we've got. And that simply is we've had a referendum. We've asked the people what they want to say. And we must, we must respect the view of the individuals who participated in one of the biggest um, democracy ballots we've ever had in the country. Um, the difference is we've got to make sure that the party, the Labour Party, uh, are the ones that are negotiating the Brexit on behalf of the people of the country, the economy, jobs, the environment, security, a decent working relationship with the 27 
uh, EU, EU nations as well following Brexit. That's why the view is we should be having a general election. If there's a, we cannot agree to anything in Parliament, I'm not keen at all of going back to the country. What I'm going to say to them, do you want to, um, do you want to leave or do you want to remain? I mean, they've already said that. So what we need is a general election. Give the people the, the opportunity uh, of voting for the party they think that'll be able to negotiate the best possible Brexit deal. Because I'll tell you, I live in a constituency where it was 70-30 leave. I was a, re a reluctant Remain. I've always wanted to reform the EU. I always have done uh, and, and democratise the EU. Having said that, my constituency was 70-30. Once the, the result was known, then I was obviously got behind the, the democratic process. And that's the way it is. Despite the fact that I, I believe that a, a cliff age Brexit will be catastrophic for the people in my constituency. So I've got a question and it's a really simple one because I'm curious about this. Right, I support all those policies. The thing that's closest to my heart is shutting down Yarl's Wood, right? So we all have something which we have a special emotional connection to. What is that my, policy for my, you? My emotional connection would be workers' rights and exploitation of ordinary people. And I think, you know, we, we've come up with a whole raft of ideas on how, and, and, and you've just mentioned, you know, John's speech today, bringing working conditions right up to 2018 and beyond. And we've got to get rid of the exploitation another thing i've got to say honestly because because you, you, you hit us there is <laughs> child poverty because mm -hmm. it really breaks my heart to think that we lived in that we live in the sixth largest economy in the world and there's 4.5 million kids in poverty that hurts me and you know what it's a political choice that we're sending our kids to school without food in their belly and that would be a massive priority for me, by the way. Workers' rights is very important. Is that more important than looking after our own kids? You know, this this is a UK in 2019, and we're not feeding our kids. And I can tell you some horrendous stories. There's rickets. Kids now, that there's record numbers of kids with rickets. This is 2018. And that when people come back, the bands come back from school uh, from the school holders. You can tell the teachers are saying that, look, some of the kids are in an awful state because they haven't been to school, they haven't been fed. We've got teachers feeding children as well, you know. So I think child poverty and poverty in general, not just in the UK, by the way, across the globe is really, really important. Poverty is really dear to my heart. Workers' rights is, you know, something, um, again, really dear to my heart. But if you want us to put it one and two, no, nah, you don't I'll, have to I'll rank go, them because you've been a great guest. I'll go, I'll go for eradicating poverty across the globe. That's another big one. That's, That's like six extra wishes. But, I mean, that was a good answer. That was Aaron, a good answer. you've got the final question. All right. Are you a Newcastle fan? Yes. Because you've got the old black and white tie, presumably. Yes. Of course you must be. Unfortunately. I mean, you know, I think you're doing all right. Really, I mean, we, we, I right. think we've got. Uh, this is where the question is going to come from. We've got two. I know exactly where the question is. Okay. Going. So, <laughs> so are you? Are you Ashley? Are you Mike Ashley out? Well, let me tell you this. I've got two season tickets in Newcastle. Yeah. And since Mike Ashley came, um, I haven't been back to Newcastle because I, I dislike the man with a great passion. I couldn't. I couldn't go and watch me beloved Newcastle. And I've been watching Newcastle. Or in, since I was a boy, who am I to wear? Yeah. Right? And I'll not set foot in St James's Park as long as Mike Ashley has got anything at all to do in the Castle United Football Club. Uh, I'm part of the, you know, like a, 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 the campaigns with the unions and to try and get Mike Ashley out. He's not a very nice character. The way he treats his workforce, particularly in at Shirebrook and the, the, the big warehouse factory, is absolutely appalling. And I couldn't sit at a football ground. None that it was Mike Ashley's baby with Sports Direct and, and feel any way comfortable. I really want rid of Mike Ashley, not just from the Castle United Football Club, but from any business here in the UK because of the, the sheer fact, the way in which he treats his workforce is quite frankly despicable. And I, 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 was, I was absolutely fuming when he came into the Commons the other week to see the Select Committee and he put his hand in his pocket and he brought a roll of 50 pound notes out and just 
plonk them into this, you know, the uh, the X-ray machine, and I just thought that's the measure of this individual. And I, I got asked if I would if I would visit the factory at Shirebrook, and this is true. And I, I was thinking, goodness me, I've got to make some excuses up here. I really don't want to go. Um, and I said, oh, I haven't got time. I can't get to the commons. And they actually rang us up and said, well, Mike's prepared to send his helicopter uh, to, to pick you up and then drop you off in London. Can you imagine me getting in Mike's helicopter um, in, in, in Newcastle United and then heading off to Shirebrook and arriving there in a helicopter with him? No, he's, a, he, he's not a very nice man. His actions are despicable. He exploits people, mainly... And people from again across the globe who have come to this country for quite simply for a better life, you know that that's all. They're not here to make fortunes; they just want a better life. And I, I cannot, I cannot sit in the, uh, St James's Park whilst that man is chairman of the Castle Football Club. Very yeah. answer. Yeah, great yeah. Avery, an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I'd love to keep you, but I know you've got plenty of things to do tonight, and I'm, I'm worried that. Uh, my friend Liz outside would, would be We should actually probably if, if share the go. one cheeky memory that we have of you, which oh, is on. at last year's end of conference Navarra party, <clears throat> I seem to recall you making a dash uh, out to the cash point and coming back with a bin bag full of lagers <laughs> for everyone at the party. Well, the, the, listen, the, the, it was a great event, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think, what was that lager? It's, 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 it's not the... The type of log we've got here, that it was red, red stripe. Oh yeah, red stripe. Was it red stripe? I think it was red stripe because I remember it being carnival beer. Red Red stripe, stripe. and and the queues were 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 getting bigger, Mm -hmm. and I didn't have any money left, so that that's that's what happened. Great stuff. Socialism in action. Absolutely, (laughs) red stripe is real, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for coming. Thanks thanks very much. We need to get back on soon, huh? Hi, we are. Uh, Good. 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 After the break, we're going to have a quick break with our latest. Sub Razor video. As you know, this is the month of hashtag Navara living wage. We are asking for you to donate to us one hour's wage per month so that we can carry on working around the clock with a new media for different politics. Uh, see you in a minute and a half, after which Matt Lawrence from the IPPR will be on the couch. He's and quite we will dishy. Be discuss it. Oh, dishy Matt Lawrence. Dishy, dishy, Matt, Matt, dishy Matt, Lawrence. Matt Lawrence. Yeah. You didn't say that about me, by the way. <laughs> oh, she did. Did she? She's, oh. she's, normally, she's normally more discreet than this, yeah. That's, that's when you've had half a lager. All right, watch our sub razor. We'll see you in a minute. I mean, it's mad when you think about it. We were just some chancers who started a radio show. We'd all come out of the student movement. I actually didn't like Aaron when I first met him. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. We had protested... Uh, against tuition fees, we'd occupied universities. We had, if you remember, we had been charged down by police on horseback in that freezing square and we lost. But a lot of us knew, I think, um, that there was this huge gap between the status quo and the future. But I think what we probably both agreed on was that we weren't represented much by the mainstream media or really by any political party. And, and that it was time for us to transform it ourselves. Right? And, and that this was the time to have those big ideas and be talking about those big ideas and that they should come from us, from all of us. I think if there's a moment when Navarra became Navarra, it was in 2015 when we interviewed Jeremy Corbyn in the leadership election. And it was the day that his odds were cut. He became mm. the favourite. And there was almost a moment before that interview where I sat down and I thought, wow, this guy could be the Labour leader. And that meant that that brand of politics was very relevant, but also that our suspicions were right. And that actually Navarra Media was on the cusp of something very, very, very important. We're at a political tipping point, right? All the old assumptions are falling away. Another world is coming. And the question is, what's it gonna look like? Neoliberalism's dying, isn't it? And Navarra Media started, what, five years ago? But it's really in the last two years we've started making a real difference. Yeah, I mean, the the sky's the limit. And, you know, so far we've been doing it all on a shoestring. I mean, I think people don't know, but all our contributors are paid, but the overwhelming majority of the core team are purely volunteers. And that has to change. And that's why we're asking you to donate just one hour's worth of your monthly wage. And we will keep working round the clock to build a new media for a different politics.
Ian Lavery, what a legend. Superhero. Love that guy. You know the one person I'd I'd like to be on the sofa in place of Ian Lavery? There's only one person in the world. Anthony Joshua. No. Hmm. Dishy Matt from the IPPR. <laughs> Dennis. Joshua is <laughs> pretty dishy. <laughs> Hashtag Dishy Matt. Hashtag yeah. Dishy Matt. Uh, <laughs> how are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah. Sorry, I got, dis I got distracted. <laughs> How's it going? Do a close-up close of his eyelash. He's got the longest eyelashes yeah, I've ever seen. Yeah. Can, we, can we get a close-up shot? Like, that is... <laughs> Are they glue ons? What is that? Like yeah, no, they're, yeah, it's um, Revlon. Oh, for yeah. fuck's sake. Mm. They don't do false eyelashes, but fine, I get the joke. And, uh, is it good? Maybe it's Maybelline. No, maybe, yeah, I can't remember. It slogan. is. Yeah. It is Maybelline. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we are, of course, talking about McDonald's, new vision for a 21st century socialism, some pretty incredible announcements today. I'm not even going to bother trying to summarise them because I'm going to ask you to do that. Is that okay? That's okay. That's your job. Brilliant. So um, today McDonald announced the Inclusive Ownership Fund, which is a proposal that sort of came out of a report I co-wrote with the New Economics Foundation. And they've kind of adapted it a little bit, but at its core is this idea that workers should share in the wealth that they create, and society also should have a claim on that. And so what they've sort of announced today is this idea that every firm with 250, more, 250 or more workers should set up an Inclusive Ownership Fund, and they would be required to issue 1% of total equity, the total value, of the firm, the total value of the shares, into this fund that would be controlled, locked, collectively owned and governed by the workers, and that as that scaled up to 10% as a sort of maximum amount, workers would then have the equivalent amount of say, of control over the company they work for, for the size of the fund, and they would also have a claim on the material benefits of the fund. So they've said it would be capped at £500, so every worker within sort of five to ten years would have a sort of substantial stake of money, but then also the surplus on top of that, on any sort of profits that the company made, would then be transferred into public investment or a social wealth fund. I mean, that's a little unclear on what they're going to do with that. But I think it's, you know, it's a really exciting announcement because I think if 21st century socialism is to amount to anything, it has to run through transformative models of democratic ownership, of rethinking who... The economy is owned by and in whose interest it works for and i think you know i think there's arguments about how we could scale this further but as an institution for sort of saying actually workers and more broadly because i think there's you know got to be careful it doesn't become too workerist but more broadly there's a sort of claim on the social wealth we create and that the institutions that we have right now just simply don't allow ordinary people to have a stake and a say in the economy this is a really interesting step so historicize me fam what where has this come from, right? Are there models of this having been tried before or has this been an idea that's been played with in different historical periods? Um, basically, did you pluck this out of thin air or is there some grounding for it? Well, no, I guess, I mean, sort of at the core of this sort of less socialist demand is economic democracy and to say that, sort of, you know, we have, should have freedom through the wealth we create and should be shared equally. So in that, that sense, it's a broad, like, expansive history that sort of sits behind this, that we should democratise capital at scale so that ordinary people have a, you know, have a freedom in sort of the economic realm. There are sort of instances in which you can sort of draw lineages from, so something like the Meidner Plan, which is, you know, before the Preston model came along, there was the Meidner Plan as like <laughs> what the left looked to as like their alternatives, but that was a sort of interesting example that was instituted in the 80s, uh, where again there was sort of, a sort of a script tax where you had to issue sort of equity rather than sort of working capital as sort of transfer of ownership to worker owned funds and I think looking at that history is interesting because it was abolished in the early 90s I think and so I think what's quite interesting here is the political economy of this um, and I think there's a real sort of question here about the design and I think for me at least I think they should be looking to design a sort of institution that transforms ownership that can a bit like right to buy uh, for the right mm -hmm. but for the left it can build a material constituency of people who are materially benefiting from this policy quite quickly. And I think that's what they failed to do in Sweden with the Meidner plan. So to, to go back to the, so the Meidner plan was, to clarify for the audience, something proposed by the Swedish Social Democrats at the end of the 70s or beginning of the 80s? Yeah, was exactly. It? So it was, um, it was a sort of particular moment in sort of Swedish political economy. Um, it was part of a very high level of sort of collective bargaining. And that collective bargaining had led to sort of wage uh, constraint, essentially, mm -hmm. and as a result, Swedish sort of capitalist firms were sort of amassing very, very substantial profits. And so as a sort of grand collective bargaining, uh, the Swedish Social Democrats, influenced by the left in Sweden, um, and then by Rudolf Meidner and a number of other economists came up with this plan to say, actually, that surplus is being generated because of wage constraints, and actually we should have a greater claim on that. 
and ultimately ownership is the institutional turn that really can transform an economy. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't reshape ownership, then ultimately you're always, you can't, you, you're going to prefigure a different economy, but you can't actually get there. And so the Meidner plan was an attempt to move beyond the limits of social democracy. And today is, in some ways, moving beyond sort of Miliband Plus, which might be what the 2017 manifesto mm-hmm. was, towards, I think, you know, as woke George might say, Corbynism 2.0. <laughs> Red, red George. Oh, is it Red George? Because now it's like woke is like a thing, but he's yeah. like he's the real he's deal. Red. He's, he's the gone real beyond deal. woke. I mean, so the, as a, can, can I just do a follow up and then I'll. Mm-hmm. So as a follow up, so the Meidner plan at its most ambitious mm. was the idea that by transferring share ownership to workers, you could ultimately event- uh, like eventually end up with worker owned firms and sort of like euthanize the sort of capitalist class yeah. um, in terms of their ownership, not in terms of their physical lives. Yeah. Um, <laughs> In this manifestation of the policy, as announced by John McDonnell, there's a 10% cap. Mm. So that seems, to me at least, to very much stunt the potential for this to radically transform who controls Britain's biggest firms. Um, is that, do you agree with that analysis? Is that a limitation that we should sort of recognise as something which precludes the possibility of this being a really transformative policy? So I don't think it precludes it. I think it's a sort of challenge, I guess, to put demands to the Labour Party and the broader Labour movement to say, actually, look, 10% is a great start, but actually, if you want deep transformation on the scale we're talking about, then you need to potentially go beyond that, not least because the dividends and the benefits and the control rights accrued will just materially benefit a much broader swathe of people so that you can actually offer on the you know, apocryphal doorstep, but you know, obviously there are lots of real doorsteps, you know, material benefits to ordinary people through a much more ambitious programme. But I think a 10% start is, you know, this is a, a radical departure in many ways. But I think what's interesting about it on the flip side, and where they could be politically quite interesting, and there could be interesting debates around this, and you've seen it because the Conservatives have been a little confused in their reaction, is it's kind of like a, a Roche-Bash, Roche-Arch test, you know, the one where you sort of Rorschach. draw Roche-Arch um, test, where you sort of draw, you know, a sort of image, and then you sort of psychologically, well, what do you relate to? What, you know, what are you sort of drawing from the image? And so you could say this policy is, on the one hand, it's sort of like, you know, it's the John Lewisization of the economy, it's everyone having a stake and a say. You could say it's the, you know, it's the fulfilment of a share-owning democracy. You could say it's, you know, confiscation of capital at scale. Or you could say, you know, it could go further, but this is an institution for socialising capital at scale. You know, it could go further, and clearly if there's a 10% cap, that's a sort of clear limit. But as an institutional innovation and sort of formation in the economy, you know, there's immense potential here for a sort of form of democratic ownership and sort of scaling contemporary socialist practices. I mean, I'm really glad that you reassured us that there are, in fact, real doorsteps. It's the kind of thing like an mm. undercover cop would say is like, you know, the metaphorical doorstep, there are real doorsteps that uh, all of you, uh, normal, ordinary citizens, <laughs> also have. Um, what's interesting to me is the lack of significant pushback on this. So... Um, when looking at the reception to uh, John McDonnell's speech is that he's been sort of reinvented by a press that's very hostile to the Corbyn project and hostile to the Corbyn element of the Corbyn project. So um, stuff about social values, stuff about foreign policy and the empowering the mobilisation of the grassroots. John McDonnell in the mainstream press imagination has been sort of reinvented as a kindly socialist bank manager figure whereas i think the policy today shows that he's willing to still pick real fights it's just that the focus has been um you know really on these social elements of the movement or perhaps you can say that there is an emerging consensus around socialist uh, economic policy that there just hasn't been the pushback that you would expect yeah i think that's right i mean i think partly it's I think it's a very well chosen terrain to fight on. I mean, I think if you look at, you know, just you know, not the statistics really sort of tell the sort of lived experience, but if you look at sort of how the wealth is distributed and how sort of control over productive assets is distributed, we know in the UK that the sort of wealthiest ten percent have, I think, nine times more than the bottom five fifty percent of the population in terms of wealth. So most normal people have very little control over their working lives, control over the companies they work in. So sort of saying. You know, it, it, I think most people say, well, it's not unreasonable to suggest that we work here, we create the wealth, we, we commit our lives to these sort of enterprises. Why shouldn't we have a say? Not least when, you know, if you look at the sort of listed companies on the FTSE, which this is applied to substantially, 
Now, the majority of British sort of based companies, or British listed companies at least, are foreign owned. Now, there's obviously a danger that it can lean into sort of slightly nationalistic politics, which I think you've got to be careful about. But I think it's also, you know, quite it's quite hard to defend saying this person works all their life to create value for this company, but they don't have it. They don't have any ownership claim over it. Whereas the Qatari Sovereign Wealth Fund or the Australian Pension Funds, they happen to own it, and therefore they have control rights and income rights derived from ownership. But the workers who create the value, who commit their lives to this project, obviously of creating value collectively, which is what a firm is, they don't have any say. They don't have any control. So I think politically, it's just it's just a sweet spot. Aaron, there's a great comment. It says ten percent. It'll go higher. <laughs> And uh, I think that's, in a way, that tends to a really important point, which is to say this isn't the, the, the final sort of destination of things. But what would you say to the rejoinder, which is, OK, this is a major, this could be £500 a year for people that work at Tesco or G4S or some of the biggest employers in the, in the, in the country who are subsidised by the taxpayer to pay poverty wages to their workers. That's great. But many of these people are already Labour voters. They're already registered. They at least can make ends meet. Clearly, for Labour to form a government, they're going to need to get millions and more people on side, right? Was it 12 and a half million last election? You want 14, 15, 16 million. That's going to require an expansion of the electorate reaching out to what may be referred to as the underclass. I like the policy. I think it's a great move, sort of a great political move, but it doesn't strike me as particularly populist. If the average person is confronted with this policy on the front pages, I agree with it. It should, it should be in the manifesto. I love it. It should have been announced today. But my, my worry is with this stuff, it's on the front page of the FT, but it's not necessarily something that you'd see on the front page of the, the Daily Mirror because it's not instantly understandable. How, so how would you respond to that? Because most people don't even know what dividends are, what equity is, or is this something... What is equity? Well, it's like a sh- sh- equity is a property ownership within a company which is uh, amongst shareholders. So you have equity in a company, 10% equity, if it's a public limited company. Next question, what is a company? Oh, okay, <laughs> Look, we won't go into this. But my point is this, or is there a broader political project here where actually we need to educate people about these things more generally? I mean, so I would say there is a Daily Mirror headline there, which is you get £500 in your pocket, which you're not going to get every year, which if you're looking at a retail worker, you know, averages out around £23,000 a year. That's you know, a not insignificant amount of money. That's an extra holiday. It's, you know, something nice for your kids, like a Christmas and their birthday, etc., etc. So Keep you, know, you out of your overdraft. Exactly. It's, mm-hmm. it's not an insubstantial amount of money. Um, and clearly, you know, as per your very wise sort of commenter, it can go higher. And if you begin to skate it higher, then it's very substantial. Uh, and I think the reason it's been capped at 500 is because the variations between sectors in terms of what the dividend return, which you know I agree is not you know your you know, your sort of apocryphal doorstep, uh, you know it's not that language people use. Um, it's not like abolishing tuition re- fees, right? No, that's, but, fi- that's fifty grand. Sure, uh, I but I think yeah, but you know only fifty percent of people go to universities. A lot more people work in companies mm-hmm. affected by this. So actually, like I think we shouldn't sort of privilege university. Uh, actually, no, I'm not the saying working that. like this would affect almost half of all people in work. A sort of substantial material offer in terms of you will be better off, and a story of saying you create this wealth collectively. Mm. Why shouldn't you have more of a claim on it? So, do you think that's it? Actually, this is a political avenue to begin a broader conversation around. Actually, wealth comes from labour, not capital. It comes from workers, not employers. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think this this is the institution which then enables you to open up a huge conversation. Great, and I think I'm, I, I, I've done a one eighty. I'm in. Judge I mean, Holden think about it, right? It's signed a, up. It's, it, and I think that perhaps the frame you should think about this in is non-reformist reforms. Mm. So what are the changes that you can uh, initiate uh, in a Labour government which doesn't require a Labour government to continue? So the thing about tuition fees, and I obviously believe uh, we should get rid of them, mm. is that that is kind of risky, is that there's nothing to say that it won't come back or, you know, we won't have the same kind of like incremental increase that we've seen um, previously. Whereas this is a non-reformist reform. It's like right to buy in lots of ways. It's going to, you know, paradigmatically alter the our social and economic realities. Can I say one more thing as well? Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that actually uh, shareholders, in terms of the duration where they own shares, forget the intra- intraday sh- trading and all this stuff, the super short-term stuff. 
the people with the the the, the, the sort of the vested interest in terms of their relationship to a business because they're with it for four, five, six, seven years. And now the workers, you know, shareholder turnover in terms of ownership of um, shares in companies is now very, very short. And again, this is, a, I think, a catalyst for starting a broader conversation because we do have a, a form of shareholder capitalism, very <laughs> short termist, often highly destructive. Uh, and I think, you know, again, if we're talking about how to definancialize the economy, how to orient it towards workers, it's great. You know, we want to start attacking the city of London. Like your colleague said today, Grace ba Blakely, she said, just like Thatcher targeted the unions as a political target, we now need to target the banks. Yeah, What do you make of that? So I think, um, I mean, it's uh, rhetorically, it's, it's a good device. And I think it's important because I think, I think the thing with this sort of, you know, as Ian was talking about, I think the attack on the unions was obviously part of a sort of distributional thing, but it was really a, as a political project and it's a totemic political project and clearly sort of reigning in financialization um, is a sort of political project for the left. It's a similar analogue, right? Yeah, there's, there's, there's an analogue there. Um, I think this. I think the analog here is what Ash said, which is the right to buy. So I think this is a, a policy that, if it's embedded, gives material interests to a huge number of ordinary people. It institutionally reshapes the the flow of wealth and power in society. It distributes it in a collective way to lots of ordinary people who are aggregated together. It's a form of economic power at scale for democratic power for ordinary workers. And it's something that once it's embedded and begins to scale over time, it's very hard to abolish. And so if it's embedded after five years, it becomes quite hard for a government to say, we're going to kick it away, that sort of, you know, do the thing that George Osborne did, where he sort of did that on your pay slip or on your, you know, whatever it was, it used to, he was like, oh, yeah, this is how much you spend on welfare now. Mm. You know, he, he introduced that to try and sort of weaponize welfare. Mm. If you did this with this, like, this is how much you get because you, you know, all wealth is social wealth, That's and ultimately, sick. you know, we they should, should do have, that. You know, you, you should have a claim on this. You know, why don't you have a claim on yeah. this? You know, and just try and rethink. I mean, I think one on a sort of deeper level, I do think there is. So this, you know, I don't know if you guys read the Adam Two's book, and so sort of obviously Adam's been in a lot of sort of he's on a politics theory other, which I know is a rival. No, it's very so good. It's, I like it's politics a very good. Theory, he was a very I good, recommend and, that podcast. I was say, we don't have any rivals. No right, exactly unparalleled supremacy. But um, on that, he's talking <laughs> about the sort of. So the plasticity of institutions post financial crisis, and how actually so much we take for granted in terms of corporate governance, in terms of what is the company, in terms of ownership, you know, we take for granted, but actually it is quite plastic, and we can begin to mould and reshape it. And I think this is only one of a number of issues and interventions the left has to make in terms of democratising the economy at scale. Great. I want to ask um, about what opposition. I mean, this is kind of to everyone. What opposition this kind of policy will face? So someone, I forgot who it was. Someone in the comments. Uh, another very good comment was talking about how the Meidner plan well in, in some analyses so in the analyses what's his name Pontus on yeah. sort of like it f in the New Left Review very good yeah. article that argues that the Meidner plan failed basically because there was a huge uh, counterattack from business business woke up to the idea that this could be sort of a slippery slope towards the end of their power over production and that brought with it a huge media onslaught um, and ultimately the Social Democratic Party were ill-equipped to sustain the policy in its most meaningful form in the face of that opposition. Um, do you see, even, and this is a less radical policy, this is a less radical policy, it's just 10%, they were talking about a whole 50%. So if we're just talking 10%, how vicious do you think the opposition will be to this policy? And from which quarters specifically will it come from? Um, so I think... The minor plan, as it was enacted, I mean, this, it, that is a very good article um, on the New Left Review, and there's lots of good stuff on both the minor plan and why it failed. Um, if it got to ten percent, that would be a much higher wa high watermark than the minor plan ever got to. Mm. In so, uh, Swedish economy and, and socialisation. So, it is a radical intervention. It is a much more, I would argue, radical intervention than almost anything that Labour has announced so far. And it's interesting that that wasn't really caught in the sort of public um, response. I think partly because actually. Radical offers can actually have majoritarian appeal. Um, but I do think um, you will see the mobilisation of opposition to it over time. And I think in some ways you need to surface that and sort of surface the antagonism and sort of lean into it, frankly, and just say, well, actually, 
does it seem that radical to require the issuing of one percent of equity over that doesn't one percent doesn't sound like a lot mm. and i think for ordinary people saying well one percent to have more of a claim over the wealth you create and to have a sort of dividend and can sort of a bit of a say over the workplaces that you sort of you know go in every day to do rather than just having entirely control of external investors and shareholders I think you lean into the antagonism with this, and I think it opens up actually a political terrain which you can counterpose genuine material interests of the majority against sort of relatively narrow sort of interests. I wonder if the fight is actually going to be there, because I actually think that kind of antagonism is very, very good for Labour. Um, Labour is best when it's picking fights and <coughs> pissing the right kind of people off. Um, something which I heard today from, of all people, Nick Robinson, and I can't remember if he said this on air or off air. Um, when I was going in to do the Today programme this morning, was, well, economically, are we all Corbynites now? I mean, I think, certainly within the Labour Party, I think the sort, of, the sort of pretty glaring but not really revealed truth is that on questions of the political economy, there's a huge consensus. So I saw Wes Streeting tweeted saying, this is a great policy, this is brilliant. But again, like, you know, if you sort of strip away some of the sort of positioning internally, like within the party, it's like, well giving ordinary people more control over their lives you're giving you know, material benefits to people that would otherwise flow it's sort of externally in a sort of extractive model of ownership and you begin to re- reshape sort of these major economic units towards much more socially useful outcomes and sort of socially inclusive outcomes so it's like yeah i think there is actually a sort of huge consensus that is kind of it almost suits all wings of the labor party to pretend that there isn't mm-hmm. um so there's a question about how real that consensus is right so i think take someone like Whereas, I mean, he's never before advocated handing over 10% of ownership to workers and sort of the wing of the party that he represents and the many people who are now currently silent about what McDonald's plans are this year would have rallied against them as insane and unreasonable if they were announced in 2013. So there's, there's a question, I think, about whether there's a real consensus about economic policy in the Labour Party or whether it's just that the right wing of the party have decided this is not the terrain they want to fight on. And so they can basically pretend we want to do this radical economic policy, which is going to re-empower the working class and take on the power of corporate elites. But we're going to do it in a, a more professional, nicer way without the complicated background of Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah. But you know that if they say, OK, we'll do, you know, Owen Smith campaign 2.0, if they take over the party, which they're not going to. Except without the 29 inch dicks. They're not going to. Yeah, except without it. I thought it was 28. 28, sorry. Which they're not going to do, by the way. Anyway, I'm pretty sure these guys wouldn't continue with the 10% worker ownership plan, Aaron. Well, this, I mean, we'll just interject. So on, no, no, but no, I, do think, so I think there is an interesting question of sort of global justice here, which I think it, this policy works in terms of, sort of like you know, ordinary workers and ordinary citizens in the UK benefiting. But I do think there is a question about sort of, you know, the rise of social wealth fund, like arguments so like Matt Brunick in the sort of US, for example, which is kind of like part of the DSA style argument around sort of let's have big forms of collective ownership. I think that's important, but we've got to remember that a lot of these firms that we own are sort of pretty extractive, rely on sort of, you know, a very sort of minor relationship with the sort of global south. So I do think, I think this is an important step. I think there's a really big uh, sort of challenge ahead in terms of both doing the technical details sort of political education, sort of the popularization, but also the sort of the complication of this policy. Because I do think that there are some sort of knotty issues that, shouldn't just be swept under the carpet. Two things. First is that every time either you or John McDonnell, who I heard speak earlier, use the word firm, my first thought is football ultras. So when you talk talks about democratising the firm, fan, so, um, you know. oh, so you know my pain too. Mm, yeah, okay, um, yeah. I kept thinking like... All the, all the Liverpool cabbies like, oh, like, all right, all right, all right. Yeah, yeah, no, I was just like, don't make me poke you yeah. in the eye as well. Yeah. Um, because I will do it. Yeah, I mean, um, that's better than... Um, yeah, um, Sorry, Liverpool, I do love you. Um, I'm not going to blind anyone. Um, That was the first thing. The second thing is that I think the fact that you bring up this Global South element is really, really interesting because I was chatting to someone recently who was trying to think about different ways in which you can um, model and frame visions of the economy to appeal to the, you know, less economically focused social movements which have, you know, sprung up from the anti-globalization movement, which is obviously super duper economic, to identity politics and liberation politics movements, anti-imperialist movements, so on and so forth. And um, <coughs> one of the things that she was saying is that, like, well, you need you need a good binary story here. And capitalism versus socialism doesn't quite do it. 
because it conjures up these images of the Cold War and a particular arrangement of geopolitics. What she was saying is that, well, what is the kind of capitalism that we live under? It's hostile, it's antagonistic, it inhibits human flourishing, it immiserates us, it's extractive. Are extractive in terms of um, domestically, the you know working class in the global north, and more fundamentally, and on a much larger scale, towards the global south. And she was like, "So, so how how do we name this? Well, it's a war economy, not the war economy that we know under fascism, but it is itself a war economy." And she's speaking from an American context, um, where thinking about economic health and uh, warfare, American imperialism, like these things are very, very much bound up. And so she was like, so what's what's the other story that you have here? You've got a local economy. You've got a sharing economy. You've got a redistributive economy. You've got a just economy. And I think that, you know, when we're talking about, well, how do we metabolize policies like this? Because I have no fucking clue when it comes to people talking economics. I still am only... 40% sure I know what an equity is after Aaron explained it. Not an an equity, equity, equity. Fine. It's not an inform. what do you call it? Uh, sorry, I'm having a, uh, now I'm a tiski in. It's you realised that, 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 that I was thing. doing a grammar mistake as a joke, it's Aaron, not an indefinite and you article. just ruined anyway, it. Sorry. Jeez. Sorry. I was, I'm a know, lightweight now, sorry. Oh, I was, you know, I was having to give a talk earlier to a bunch of economists, and I was like, when you're speaking in front of them with a background in arts, in literature, you feel like a Labrador dressed in a trench coat trying to open a bank account, like you're completely out of your depth. What I'm interested in is how you metabolise these policies and how you communicate these policies. Um, I think the £500 in your pocket thing is great. It's something which, you know, people can understand and elections can turn on them. But also in terms of how do you bring together a, um, a social movement coalition that can get behind it, uh, which has been steeped in antagonisms and conflicts which aren't simply economic i think this opposition between war economy extractive economy uh, versus redistributive economy is yeah a way of communicating it uh, yeah so i mean i think that there's a real challenge here in the sense that if this is just a social i mean it's kind of a bit like i mean i, I don't think like going back to 45 is particularly healthy for the left but if it you know the analogy of the 45 moment was like if it, this is just about socializing firms but not really changing their purpose and their operation and their outcomes they generate and whether they're so extractive or generative uh well not quite what's the point but you know really what's the point and a bit like in 45 if it's just like you know we're just going to nationalize privates of you know the british steel and we're just going to nationalize it but we're, gonna, we're not going to change how it operates or we're just going to have the sort of same old managers but just under a new ownership structure what's the point so i think both this policy but in a sort of pluralistic basket of sort of, um, sort of ownership strategies, which I think has to be central to any left strategy, it has to be not just simply, well, we're just going to transition ownership but not change the purpose and the outcomes and the activities. It has to be about moving from extraction to generation, from sort of concentration to inclusivity, from sort of footloose and, you know, shifting. To flash dance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. For, uh, you know, no, flash no. dance. Kevin Bacon. Flash dance plus £500 <laughs> in your Patrick pocket. Crazy. That's the manifesto, I'd say. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that is it. Like, you've, it has to be about ownership as an institutional turn that generates, you know, not just different material outcomes, which I think is important and like fundamental, but also you know, a sort of different politics of feeling and a different, a different society. I'm going to start collecting questions whilst you type them. And that's, that's, yeah. I, I thought of that, Aaron. Whilst you Sorry type your that. questions, whilst you think of them, Aaron, you have the floor. Yeah, so we've got about 550 people watching this. So I just want to say, um, you know, we want to do, we've been doing, what, 90 shows every night since, what, Saturday? Yeah. We want to do that every day of the week. Um, and that's going to require many of you going to support .com, helping us build a new media for different politics. Um, Aaron, what's your show going to be called? It's going to be called The Bastani Factor. And the acronym there, of course, is TBF. Ooh. Perfect. Mm. I like it. I'll be doing a weekly show. Tiski, of course, is Michael's baby. We were going to call it The Vehicle, because it was a vehicle for Michael Walker. Uh, Ash Sarka. Ash Wednesday. Ash Maybe Wednesday. Wednesday nights. I like it. What day, of the, what, what day of the week are you going to go for? I don't know. I, I don't really care. I'm at your disposal. Everybody look, Everybody knows you guys are the... You two are like the bosses of Navarro now. Well, I got Monday. Ash has got Wednesday, so you've got... You did What What me did you do today? I did talk radio. It's not... And you did Radio 4. What did I do? I did nothing. No. I'm making the shareables. I was like putting on the glass like... Mm. <laughs> I went actually... You know, you know I went on... 
talk radio for my sins this morning with Julia Hartley Brewer. And what she said to me when I first arrived was, so I've been told you're the new Aaron Bastani. <laughs> I think you're far more loose than I, said, I am. I said, I'll take that. I'll take that. I think, no, you're, yeah, we have different Anyway, things. this, isn't, different, this we have, isn't... We have different things going on. Yeah. Um, I've been told, so I hear you're the short Aaron Bastani. <laughs> Um, so we want to do daily shows just like this. I think it's really important. I think you know it's really important. Um, the left is doing very well in online blogs, text, etc. But audio, visual content, videos, podcasts is a different kettle of fish. It's not cheap. It's not easy. Help us grow because it's only going to get harder, paradoxically, as we win more and more. Question. We've already said in various ways, this hasn't really met much resistance. I mean, you know, if you look at previous speeches given by John McDonnell in the last couple of years, they were often nowhere near as sophisticated or actually slick. It was it was really well delivered. He looked like a chancellor. He looked like fucking like he looked like the head of the IMF or something. It was really weird. Uh, obviously amazing. Um, but this, to me, betokens the importance of the democracy review and democratising the Labour Party because there's no... And also not fetishising mandatory selection because there's no point getting rid of 200 Blairites... Well, there's not 200 Blairites in Labour, to be fair. 200 pencil, pen, pencil pushers who aren't really care, don't really care about social justice or socialism just to replace them with people who rhetorically support these things but actually don't want to jump through the hoops and make them happen. So... It's easy to talk a good game, right? And right now, it seems to me that this is now the new consensus around this stuff. So we saw the IPPR report. Matt works at IPPR. Uh, we saw the IPPR report. said incredibly radical things. But because Justin Welby was attached to it, the Archbishop of Canterbury, because Helena Morrissey was attached to it, big name in the city, because the corporation of the city of London were involved, nobody could attack it. But clearly... In a general election, when Labour advanced precisely these kinds of policies, the establishment is going to have to attack it. So what can we do strategically? Now, viewers may remember the letter on the front page, I believe, of the Times, or maybe the Mail in 2015. A hundred business leaders sent this letter to Ed Miliband saying, or rather, they sent it to the paper, saying, don't vote Labour. Only the Tories. How funny, right? It shows you how they know fuck all. You have to vote Tory for stability and for the economy. What can we do strategically to insulate ourselves from that? Or should we say, you know what, we're going to war with fucking business? I mean, I think there are, there are sort of, I guess, two strategies, it seems to me, for the left. You can either sort of lean into the antagonism and sort of that, you know, really amplify it and sort of be like, yes, explicitly, that's what we want. Um, mm -hmm. Or you can try and be like, no, this is about, you know, a better form of inclusive growth and ownership which and arguably it is right which, which, is, which I, think, I think the beauty about this is in some ways that you can kind of say it is for all those things and they would be kind of true for all these things because it both is a way of giving people more of a stake and you know more productivity because we're all invested but also you know it is an institution of radical socialization and i think if socialism is about democratization at every level of society this is an institution to do it at sort of the firm level at least for large scale firms. Now there's a lot of detail to be worked out, but that has to be done. Um, so you think the pitch should actually be quite friendly? So well, the, the pitch... You I don't think, think it should be a confrontation one where you say, look, we're going to, we're empowering workers, it doesn't stop here, this is just the first step. What, what, what's the... Well, so I think partly, like, I don't think, I mean, I think we shouldn't sort of, like, uh, fetishise workers, although, you know, workers are obviously a big constituency and an important part, but A, it's not even workers, that's not their sole definition, so I think people are carers, and learn, you know, so I think I mean they're all workers, though, right? Partly, yeah. I mean, I mean yeah, carers, so I carers work yeah. reproduces so, so, the labour yeah, power so, of workers. So no, yeah, workers. Okay, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So not, yeah, so so an expansive definition of it, I guess, is more what I mean. Not yeah. sort of the, purely the uh, sort of employment uh, relationship as a workhorse of. Yeah, so, um, well, it's uh, the acknowledgement that we're exploited in many other spaces than just formal employment yeah, ones, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's much better. Put. Uh, it's it's the analysis of capitalism and relations under capitalism, which. Uh, looks at the commodification of all social relations rather than just the one of direct contact. I guess my question is because we're going to go to these the questions on the thing. You know, John John's pitch is of a very competent bank manager, and I wonder how far that can go. And I, so I think it's so yeah, so uh, yeah, or sort of should be more. I and think, this is at the heart I of think that, any, right? This yeah, but radicalism will require competency. 
you know, I, don't, I think like you're saying, well, yeah, he's a competent, he looks like a competent bank manager, but really to be radical, he has to like fucking like take his shirt off and run look, around this conference. Come going, on, oh, yeah, fucking, we're look, going. that's so all in the past, Matt. You don't need to slag me. That was 2010, okay? Yeah, exactly, exactly. But you know, birth the new movement. So well done, mate, well done. But, um, it was like Demi Moore pregnant, like on the cover of Vanity Fair, Aaron Bastani shirtless in front of Topshop. It was giving birth to something new. Mm, interesting analogy. I'm sorry, I'm very tired. All I have left is pop culture. I'm so <laughs> sorry. So, but it sounds to me like... Oh, also, so talking of social forces mobilised against it, one of the big uh, sort of blocks mobilised against it, well, sorry, a block, it's four people. ABBA were one of the big opponents of the Minder Plan. Uh, and they well, said, ABBA, ABBA. ABBA, wow. Uh, like, take a chance on me, money, money, money. And they were... Don't they take didn't my like money the minor... for the Minder Plan, take mm. it to my bank account. I'm Bernie? No, is his name Bernie? I can't remember. I don't know. What, a member of ABBA? Yeah, one of those people. Bjorn? Bjorn? Bjorn, Bjorn, I knew he was a big Scabs, ABBA are scabs. ABBA, ABBA are scabs. scabs. But that will... N- don't tell Ian Lavery. Well, is he a big he... ABBA fan? Well, he's just like anti-scabs. Break his heart. He's anti-scabs. He's got a call back, guys. He's like, call back, come on. I'm getting the first fucking ferry to Sweden. Now that we know that ABBA are scabs, now that we know that ABBA are scabs, does it mean that I can't have Gimme, Gimme, Gimme played at both my wedding, my divorce party and my funeral? After midnight. Mm. That's the internationale, isn't it? What? Yeah, that's the, you should be playing the internationale. When you're uh, it will be talking the hardest or gimme, gimme, gimme. No. Sorry. Let's take some questions. All right, we've got one of these out there questions, which I really like. Libertarian Socialist Future says, should local socialist worker councils, syndicates of trade unions, parallels of regular councils with more power become an official policy of Labour? Soviets? Is that Soviets? Should, should we be backing... Socialist worker councils. Um, so I'd say, yeah, the, the, so the new slogan shouldn't be like all power to, to the, the Soviets. Soviets. Electrification should be all power to uh, democratic councils and datification. So like, you know, let's take the sort of Barcelona model, reclaim data sovereignty and yeah, have lots of yeah, deep in democracy at the local level. If that counts as an answer. Scabba. That's in the question. Scabba. That's I love it. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Nailed it. Ash, I'm giving you this. What? Should Remain be on the ballot in a second referendum? I have no great love for a second referendum. And I think, unlike you, because we talked about this over a shared bagel in the morning, is that um, I would still, overall, at this particular juncture, prefer to stay in the EU. I think the problem with having Remain on the ballot is that it will be understood as an attempt to subvert and reverse the result of 2016 and you can see why because it will split the leave vote and remain would win by a clear margin i don't think that um trying to come up with a you know technical uh, referendum fix to the crisis that you know 2016 exposed is th- is the right way to go about things it looks like cheating it looks like trying to duck out of the social, economic and political forces that drove that result in the first place. Um, What we should be focusing on, and when I say we, I don't just mean the left, I mean we as journalists working in any capacity, is paying very close attention to what the precise choreography towards a general election looks like. Because as long as we're talking about a people's vote, vote on the terms or whatever you want to call it, the Tories are actually fairly happy because we're reopening this divide which ultimately serves them very, very well because what we're doing is reopening a, a divide within our own uh, you know, social coalition. Whereas when we go, okay, we're going to vote down this deal. Um, it's not going to meet the six tests. right? We're going to you know, fuck up your government. How do we get from that to um, you know, six weeks snap election ting? Then people are much less Not happy. Not six much weeks. Less, oh. Come on, we want eight weeks. We want eight weeks because we need to register like about half a million young people. Please God, not six weeks. Please God, not six weeks. I mean, listen. There's this ginseng stuff that you can have, and it's really like it's like organic coke or something. It's really good. Mm. Um, Is that not what you that tell would yourself, know okay. what the uh, latter would be like. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Um, ginseng. More questions. Six weeks. Another another random question. I'm giving this to you, Aaron. Mm. Should Labour back proportional representation? Uh, I like proportional representation. The British came up with a great system called additional member system, AMS, and they gave it to the Germans after the Second World War because it's very democratic, but it also gives governments mandates to govern. 
Um, and the British were so clever, they gave it to Germany but wouldn't give it to themselves. Uh, so I would favour AMS. Um, it's not pure proportion, proportion representation. It's still really effective. Uh, it's far more democratic than what we presently have. I think it's a good compromise. Not only would I have AMS, I would have AMS for two elected houses, both the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Either that or you simply get rid of the House of Lords. Excellent. But I quite, li I quite like the idea of a second chamber. All right, you, you're getting one more question. Ash is getting one more question, then we're doing final points. Because we want to go to the CWU party, don't we? I want to um, go to bed. My God, I'm tired. Come on, you've probably slept more in the last two nights than you did the whole of the last last EVT, which was crazy. That is true. That was crazy. I slept more. I didn't sleep. I slept maybe six hours that whole thing. Yeah, I remember you having like a skinny crazy. dip last uh, late party conference. I remember you emerging from the sea, like, you know, Venus from the waves. It's like, like freezing. Um, what's her name? Uh, Ursula Andres. Ursula Andres, yeah, that's right. And you were like Sean Connery. Oh, was I? I'll take yeah, that. Yeah, got the phone. <laughs> Matt, Johnny Cuba asks, when will publishing salaries be on Labour's agenda? I mean, I think they've got some things around... Presumably this would be all of them. I'm going to rephrase this as, do yeah. we want all salaries to be published? I mean, Max, I'm a broke bitch and I don't want people to know. Yeah, I mean, so there's sometimes like there's this sort of um, emphasis on sort of transparency as a mechanism for change. And uh, well, if you make things transparent, I think, you know, sure, make them transparent or at least sort of higher earners so you can sort of mm. use that point of leverage to try and sort of democratize and equalize within the firm um, and across society. But, you know, yeah, do I think low income workers should be forced to reveal? Yeah, well, ultimately, Labour should be making sure there aren't low-income workers is the answer. So, yeah, if it, if they should be a builder society where you can have transparent pay because actually no one earns less, uh, lo low enough money to, you know what I mean, I'm tired. Can right. I respond to that? I just need to intervene because we've, I've, I've got an important WhatsApp message. Go on. From uh, legendary Gary. 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 We love Gary. Gary. We love Gary. 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 But Gary's, Why are you doing Gary's in a difficult situation. <laughs> Why? Because the show's been going on for a while, yeah, and he needs a piss. Uh. <laughs> well, we're coming to an end now, Gary. Gary, just one more minute. Okay, all right. One more, like, let's do. With let's your do... help, we can buy so Gary a piss pot. <laughs> we can buy him a yeah. piss, and pot. we can put it next to the computer. And while he's live streaming, he's urinating into it. <laughs> <laughs> Is he okay. stopping the live stream? Like, we're, like, we're gonna no, wind down. We're gonna wind down, Gary. I also okay? need a piss. Yeah. I need a piss. Anyone we all I need a piss. Can you not? Are you fine? What's wrong with you? It's getting quite late. It's getting quite late. Everyone's got a minute to give yeah. their final okay. thoughts and then we're getting this stream off air. Okay. Final thoughts. Okay, so I'm really excited for Auntie Diane's speech tomorrow because she's actually the most rad fucking anti-racist in the Corbyn project. Corbyn gets a lot of hype. Auntie Diane does not get the prop does not get the props uh, that she truly deserves. She's been doing the Lord's work on immigration, not far enough yet, but um, I think that is up to us as outriders to create that space. And I'm really interested to see what she's going to have to say about policing, which is something which has slid off the agenda. You've had mm. Sadiq Khan making, I think, more reactionary and regressive arguments when it comes to things like stop and search. I want to see some good radical policing policy out of her. I think you may be uh, satisfied what we might be seeing tomorrow. Mm. Aaron, blend that into your final points, come on. Um, okay, so Matt was saying about transparency, I entirely agree with you. Look at the BBC in terms of gender pay. Gender pay gap in the BBC uh, is clear because they published the data. They published the data two years ago. What's changed? Fuck all. Uh, there's a bit of media outrage, that's it. So transparency is good, we're not saying it's bad. But you know, it doesn't mean much. WikiLeaks was about transparency. It's a very liberal Assangeist politics. By all means, publish the data. But in and of itself, that's not a political solution. The political solution would require, you know, legally mandating organisations to pay people the same regardless of their gender. Uh, so I agree with you. Often transparency is uh, it's an easy, it's a sort of it's a safe space for uh, liberals. Matt. So I'd say ownership fundamentally structures power, wealth, control in society. And if Labour and the left are serious about transforming society, they have to put democratic ownership at the heart of that. And I think today's announcement is a really interesting step. I think there's big questions around the technical details. But I think on the politics of it, I think it's a really exciting opening. And I think, you know, without that, sort of, it's necessarily going to be limited. And I think actually today is the first day of a genuine sort of potential radical socialist agenda going forwards, 
rather than just millibandism and plast. So I actually think this announcement today is an institution of socialization and economic control and democracy for ordinary people that I think has real potential to be a sort of transformative moment implemented. In the words of Owen Jones, like you know he says ordinary working people. He says Beeble. It's like ordinary working people. Beeble. Yeah. Beeple. We well, he spent a lot of time in Stockport growing up, that makes sense, right? Yeah no, he's from Stockport. Beeple. Is he from <laughs> was he born in Stockport? Uh, yeah. I imagine he was born in a hospital. Uh, he lived we, in, he, he was the hospital was not behind in a oh, was he? Door. All right. Anyway, it's wrong. Look, we're going. We're going. Gary, I'm, you can have a piss. No, no, no. I'm going to finish with... The point I'm going to finish with is, one, if you want to help us build this organisation so we can go nightly, ultimately, uh, please go to support.navarromedia.com. Please share this show. Share our channel. Encourage all your friends and family to donate one Subscribe. hour's wage a month just do that right now just hit the subscribe uh, button but the final thing I want to say is not only a shout out to Gary but a shout out to Tony and Georgia our fabulous behind the scenes team who have done an absolutely stellar job mm. this <coughs> Labour Party conference as they Treats. will continue to do throughout this week well I mean we've only got two more days but uh, anyway yeah shout out to the Navarra gang the whole gang we had a big gang here Camille's left Eleanor's here obviously who else is here? Dolly is here. Sharing beds, holding and each other for. Please don't. You're, this you're, is going to get silly. This is going to get silly. Some more conspiracy this theories. was Tisky Sour. We are Navara Media. Media. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> <very, laughs> Thank you very much for watching. It's been great. I think it's time we went. So good night. Good night.